So let me, uh, so the setting is we have a polynomial, which we want to minimize over a basic closed semi-algebraic set K. And as, uh, as uh, already mentioned, this is a hard problem, non-convex, non-linear in general, and it captured hard combinatorial problems such as computing the stability number of a graph. I just mentioned it because you can, this has a ve very versatile uh, uh, optimization formulations via optimization either over the hypercube, the simplex, or the unit spheres. And here I have just recalled how you can uh, reformulate the stability number either using the hypercube, the simplex, or the unit sphere. So this is an indication that already optimization over, over very look, simple looking feasible regions is interesting. So today I will want to discuss two hierarchies of bounds. The first one is a hierarchy of lower bounds, which is due to lasser parillo which is based on the, uh, the sum of square approach. And this is a hierarchy I have introduced last time, but I will recall it very briefly. So I will, in this lecture, I denote, I, I call it FR with R as an index in order to indicate that this is a lower bound. And we will introduce a second uh, hierarchy of bounds, which will now be upper bounds on the minimum. And I use the superscript R in order to indicate that this is an upper bound. So a common feature is that if we fix the, the order of the bound, they can be computed using semi-definite programming and they converge asymptotically to the minimum of F. And uh, uh, my focus today is what can we say about the error uh, of the, the error range which you make when you compute the bound with respect to the minimum. So first, just to fix uh, ideas, I very briefly recall what are the sum of squares lower bounds. So we want to minimize F over K. In other words, we want to find the largest scalar lambda for which F minus lambda is non-negative over K. K is semi-algebraic, which means it's defined by polynomial inequalities. So the key idea is that we replace a hard non-negativity condition by an easier condition. Namely, we try to write F minus lambda as a conic combination of the constraints where the multipliers, the SJ, are sums of squares and we put a degree bound on every summand at most degree 2R, 2R, and 2R for all the summons. And in this way, we get lower bounds on the minimum, which get better and better as the degree bound increases and they converge asymptotically and they can be computed via semi-definite programming. Okay, so what can we say about the error? So there is a, a result by Ni and Schweikhofer from 2000, 2007, which gives uh, an estimate, an upper estimate on the error you make when using the lower bound. And this upper estimate looks like this. So there is a constant depending on the degree and the number of variables on F. Most important is to look at the regime. How does the bound R, how the degree bound R, how does it, does it come up into, into the picture? So we see it comes up as a, with a logarithm, logarithm of R, and it also comes up with a square root with base C. And, and this constant C is in general not known, it depends on set K. So this is a nice, this gives an, a quality estimate, but it's quite a, a weak estimate. Now we, you take the, the square root of the logarithm of R. So this is, a, a, one would hope to find some a better estimate. And, and this turns out actually to be a difficult question, how to find a better error. And this is probably not the correct error analysis. And uh, so for instance, there is this result by Fong and Fuzzy in 2020, which actually shows that the, the right error uh, analysis is in one over R square. So for the case when you, for the special case of polynomial optimization over the unit sphere. So this is the, the, the exact result that they show. So you see the, the error range is in one over R square. So I will actually come back to this result at the end of the lecture. Uh, because what I want, uh, uh, there is a very interesting uh, uh, thing which is happening, which, uh, which is that actually there is an intimate link between the analysis of the lower bound, so this bounds 
the sums of squares hierarchy, like this result, and the analysis of the upper bounds, which I am going to define next. So what in the rest of the lecture, what I will now do is to define the upper bounds, then give you information on how to analyze them, because actually they, it will turn out that they are much easier to analyze. And finally, at the end of the lecture, I will return to the lower bounds, how to analyze them in the case of the sphere. And we are going to see how we can nicely use what we know from the upper bound to transport it to the lower bounds. Okay, so now I should uh, uh, start introducing what is the second uh, hierarchy of uh, upper bounds for the minimum of a polynomial over K. So they're sometimes called measure based and they're due to Lasser. So in order to, to define the bounds, we start back from uh, the formulation of our optimization. We want to find a point X in K, which minimizes F of X. And now, as I already mentioned uh, uh, on Monday, what you can do is identify points with Dirac measures. And then the minimization turns out to be, you minimize, you are trying to find a probability measure on K, which minimizes the integral of F with respect uh, to, to this uh, unknown measure mu. So the next thing which uh, Lasser observed is that actually, in this optimization problem here, we do not need to optimize over all probability measures. It's enough to do the following. Let us fix a measure mu with support k. For instance, think of the Lebesgue measure. We fix the Lebesgue measure. And then it's enough to search for a sum of square densities with respect to the given reference measure mu. So in other words, the minimum of F can be reformulated as the optimization problem where you are trying to find a sum of squares, sigma. It should be a sum of square density, which gives a probability measure. So in other words, you are asking that the integral of sigma d mu should be equal to one. So this is telling that the, the measure sigma mu is a probability measure on K. And then you minimize the integral of F sigma with respect to this reference measure mu. And actually, this is not very difficult to, to, to understand why such a result should be true. Because remember here, on top I said, we are trying to, to find a good Dirac measure. But a Dirac measure, it's just a, a peak. Huh? You have one at a point and zero uh, outside of the point on the set K. And now you can approximate a Dirac. You can approximate it with a continuous function, um, which is non-negative on K and, and close to the Dirac. And then, Continued use function can be approximated by polynomials and by some and by squares of polynomials and so. So this is not so difficult to understand intuitively why such a result should be true. So we, if we want to get bounds now, what we should do is we should put a degree, uh, restrict our search to sums of squares of a given degree. So this is what we do. We take an R and we restrict. Uh, to, to, to sums of squares of the at most to R. And then we obtain this parameter FR, which is an upper bound on the minimum, which gets better and better as we let the degree bound to R grow and grow. And this uh, uh, parameters converges from up now to the minimum of F or set K. And if you fix a given R, you can compute it with, via a semi-definite program. And actually, it's, it's as we are going to see in a few slides, this is actually a very simple semi-definite program because there is only just one uh, constraint. And uh, as we are going to see later, you can just use this to reformulate it. Actually, it turns out to be a computation of an eigenvalue of a suitable matrix. But I, I will return to that later. So there is one thing to be, to, to, to be mentioned here, which is, of course, you can always define the bound, but if you want to compute it, well, actually, you need to know the moments of the, the reference measure mu. Because when you express, uh, if you compute the integral of f d mu, then you get a, a linear combination which involves the moments of the measure. So this is uh, uh, something to be aware of. These bounds can only be computed on sets which are simple enough so that you know the, the, the moments, so, so that you, you can compute the moments. But nevertheless, 
Such moments are known if you are optimizing over simple sets such as cubes, balls, simplex, or the sphere equipped with a hard measure, and so on. So, so the, at least this, there is a rich enough class of problems where, where we know the moments so we can compute the bounds. So it makes sense to look at this hierarchy of upper bounds. Of course, you could also argue that, well, to get an upper bound, you just can just pick a point x in the set and you evaluate f and this gives you an upper bound, which is of course correct. But so, so the idea here is that you are trying to, to focus the search about the region in the space uh, k, which is closest to the global minimizers. This is what these sums of squares are trying to do. They are trying to approximate the Dirac measure at the, at the global minimizers. So let's just uh, uh, illustrate this on the case of the Motskin polynomial, which we minimize over the hypercube of the box. So it has four global minimizers, which we see here. Here is one, second one hidden here, one, and so the fourth one. And now let's see how the optimal sum of square density uh, would uh, look like. So at degree 12, uh, we see it uh, happening. So the high, so in red are the high values of uh, the function. At degree 16, we see that this optimal sum of squares starts peaking at the, around the four global minimizers. And as the degree increases, it peaks more and more and so on. So this is how the optimal sum of square density is behaving. It's trying to, to capture the global minimizers of the, of the polynomial over the set K. So our goal is to understand what can we say about the error range, so the, the difference between the upper bound now and the minimum of f. So in this table, I uh, show you what, what, we, what do we know about this error range. So we see that, so in this column, I have, uh, uh, I have given here the upper bounds that we know. So there are two regimes. So it's one over r square, which we know for a number of situations. And let's start with the, uh, the lowest row in the, in the table, which shows an uh, error estimate in log r square over r square, which is true for a very uh, big range of sets for convex bodies or, or even for semi-algebraic sets of FET, which means that they, are in, that they have um, a dense interior equipped with a Lebesgue measure. And this last row is, will be the first uh, uh, um, set of results which we are going to concentrate just after. To, to, I will explain how we get this error, uh, this error range. All the other error estimates here are in one over R squares, and they hold for special classes of sets such as a hypercube, sphere, ball, uh, simplex, special convex bodies. And the, the strategy to, to prove this whole uh, bunch of results here will be actually to start from the very simple uh, basis case, which is try to optimize a linear function over in the univariate case, so over an interval equipped with a class of, fun of uh, measures which of Jacobi type. So this looks, of course, in, the, the optimization problem in itself is not interesting, but what's interesting is the analysis of the bound, because then we are going to be able to transport what we learn about this special case to other more complicated cases, so an arbitrary polynomial on the interval or on the box, then uh, extending the, the, the kind of uh, measure we put on the, on the interval, then moving on to the sphere, to the ball, and to other sets. So there will be two strategies to reach these results. So the first key strategy will be, which we will follow in order to get the general uh, uh, rate in log r square over r square for general k. The first strategy will be just to follow the definition of the bound, which is try to find a nice sum of square polynomial density, which looks like the Dirac delta at the global minimizer. And one more thing we will do is actually we will analyze a simpler univariate bound for that. That will be the first key strategy. The second key strategy, if we want to get this uh, uh, improved rate in one over R square, uh, 
what we are going to do is go back to the bound and realize that this is actually an eigenvalue problem. And we can relate the, this eigenvalue problem to the bound. We can relate it to extremal roots of orthogonal polynomials. And in very special case, like orthogonal polynomials on the, on the interval minus one, one, where lots is known about the behavior of, the, of the extremal roots of orthogonal polynomials. And we will use this knowledge in order to learn something about the bounds. And after that, we are going to transport what we learned from the special simple case, univariate case. We are going to transport it to other situations or other sets and equipped with other measures. So that's a bit the, the, the plan, plan of the day, at least for the upper bounds. So I will now discuss the first strategy, which is uh, used in order to be able to, to get this uh, rate in log R square over R square for general sets K. And this general strategy is get nice SOS approximations of Dirac measures. So here I've just started with recalling what is a bound which we are going, which we are trying to understand. Huh? Fine, we try to find a nice sum of square density. And as I, I already hinted at, a first uh, reduction is to, to actually, let's be less uh, uh, greedy and let's, instead of searching for, for a multivariate sum of square, or best one, let's just try to find a nice univariate sum of square S which we are then going to, 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 to use in order to select sigma of the form S of F. So we, we are going to search for univariate sum of square S. And if we, if we evaluate it at F of X, then we are going to get the multivariate sum of square of a very special form, of course. But, um, but maybe that's already good enough in order to get the, the, the error analysis that we are looking at. So, on, on, a, on an abstract level, what is happening here? What's happening is that actually uh, we are, instead of integrating over K with respect to the measure mu, we are taking the measure mu f, which is a push forward of mu by f. And then we are, integrated on, we are integrating on the image of K by f. And if you read this line, so, this is saying that the first program here is, is the same thing as, so this integral here is the same thing as the integral of t, s of t, with respect to the push forward measure. And here the constraints become that the integral of s with respect to the push forward measure should be equal to one. So in other words, if, uh, so I, I, I uh, call this bound now, I call it the, the, the bound, the push forward measure bound. So this is what this uh, uh, subscript here look, means. So you can view it, if you look at the second program, you can view it as the upper bound for the very special univariate problem where you ask to minimize T univariate over F of K. So F of K, well, say it's connected. So F of K is, will be just the interval between the minimum value of F and the maximum value of F. So we have the trivial problem minimize t over this interval. And this second program is trying to understand what is, the, is, is exactly expressing the upper bound for this special polymer optimization problem on this interval. And uh, uh, so, so it's in, in this way, we obtain these this bounds, these push forward bounds are of course uh, weaker than the multivariate bounds we had defined in the beginning. So we have this uh, sandwich inequalities. So these are the weaker bounds. But what Lasser proved is that actually they are weaker, but they still converge to the minimum of F on, uh, on, on, on the set K. And uh, what we next uh, uh, observe is that actually we can already estimate the range between the weaker upper bounds. And for that, we are going to to construct a, a, a nice univariate sum of squares. So we want to, so the minimum of T over the interval is attained, of course, at the minimum. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's attained at the border of the interval. So what we need to find is a nice sum of square which peaks 
maybe let's look at this picture. If we look at this green uh, uh, um, curve here, so this is a, a so-called uh, half needle polynomial, which is used in approximation theory. The other one are needle polynomials, but all of them are approximations of, of the Dirac delta at here at the origin. So this uh, needle and half needle polynomials are very widely used in approximation theories. These are well developed to get good approximations of uh, Dirac delta. And, and half needle are nice because they converge even faster. We see it's a green uh, polynomial here. It, he goes, it goes much, uh, it gets small values much faster, uh, very nearby zero. And this is exactly the kind of polynomial that you need in order to uh, analyze the bound. So the half needle polynomial is obtained actually as a squares of Chebyshev polynomials, which are suitably scaled. But uh, uh, using such uh, uh, half needle polynomials, then we are able to, 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 to conclude that the error bound between the, so the between the, the push forward upper bound and the minimum of f behaves like log r over r square. And this is very general. It holds when k is uh, any convex body or, or compact semi algebraic set with a dense interior. So this. Uh, uh, sorry. So this. Uh, um, uh, estimate is actually almost tight in the sense that if you if you look at the class of polynomials of the form uh, x to the d to to to, to d an even power, then the rate is uh, so with a low bound in one over r square. So the truth lies somewhere between one over r square and log r over square over r square for for this for this push for, forward uh, bounds. On the other hand, <clears throat> for, the, for the multivariate upper bounds, uh, the behavior is better. One can show that the behavior is better. So, <clears throat> so, so this estimate applies for the weaker upper bounds, hence for the stronger upper bounds. And sometimes the stronger upper bounds have a better behavior. But, uh, so uh, uh, a question is, can we get rid of this log R uh, uh, term here? Uh, probably yes, it could very well be that it is just an uh, artifact of the analysis. And uh, as I want next to explain is that actually we can indeed get rid of this factor for the multivariate bounds. For the for uh, some classes of nice set scale. Okay, so before moving to this uh, other analysis of the sets uh, of a uh, uh, wider class of set scale, simple set scale, I want to make a first observation which will make uh, our life easier. And this observation is that actually it's enough to address. Uh, to analyze quadratic polynomials. And the idea is very simple. So uh, I'm sorry, this is uh, the joys of working at home. My telephone doesn't. Apologies, this is, this are the joys of working at home. <clears throat> so in order to, to so what, what we should observe is that if we have a polynomial F, which we minimize over K, and we take a global minimizer uh, of F in K, then we can replace uh, F by its, an upper estimator, which you obtain by taking Taylor theorem. So we just take the second order Taylor approximation of F, and we get a quadratic polynomial, which I denote by G in red. And uh, so this is an upper estimator, which has the same, takes the same minimum value on the set K as F. Sigma. Jules, I don't need to be 
so since we have, apologies again. So if, since we have this upper estimator G, which is quadratic and takes the same minimum as F over the set K, this, then this implies that the error bound of on F is upper bounded by the error you can make if you analyze G. So in other words, uh, so, so take, take away of this slide is that it suffices to analyze quadratic polynomials. And so, so we are going to, to use this very much later. Okay, so I now want to uh, um, get to get to this one over R square uh, analysis for the upper bounds. And the starting point is to get, give a eigenvalue reformulation for the upper bounds. So I have repeated here the definition of the upper bounds. And the, the a key thing we can do is to use an orthonormal basis to express polynomials. And we choose this orthonormal basis to be orthonormal with respect to the measure mu, which we have uh, selected on the set K. And then we can, when we search for our optimal sum of square density sigma, we can use this uh, orthonormal basis to, to find it. And in this way, it's just very uh, easy derivations. We obtain that the upper bound, uh, we, we can obtain it by searching for as this semi-definite program. So we search for PSD matrix X, trace one, and the objective function is a trace in a product of X with this matrix M of F, which I've given here. And so the, it's a moment, it's, it can be seen as a localizing moment matrix of F, so where whose alpha beta entry is the integral of f p alpha p beta. So the usual moment matrix would be if you would have here the monomial base instead of p alpha p beta, but uh, it's just changing base. So in other words, the upper bound is nothing but the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix. So the upper bound boils down to the smallest eigenvalue of a matrix whose entries you get by uh, evaluating the integral of f with respect to the product of the p alpha p beta, which are the selected uh, orthonormal basis. So the upper bound is the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix. So if we can get our hands on, this, on the behavior of the eigenvalues of these matrices, then we are at home. And this is exactly what we can do in the simple case when K is just an interval and uh, so the univariate case. As I've already argued, it's enough to analyze the case when the polynomial is quadratic at most. So we are going to do this in two steps, first F linear and then F quadratic. So the most simple case, uh, F is linear. So F, F, F of X is X, which, and, and K is just the interval minus one, one. And, and now the nice thing is that we can just uh, uh, rely on the, this uh, basic result of uh, in the classical theory of orthogonal polynomials, which says the following. So our PK was uh, an orthonormal base with respect to the base measure mu. And then as is well known, they satisfy a three term recurrence, which I have shown here. And so, this matrix, which I just defined, now whose entries are, the, uh, so now f of x is x, so the entries are the integral of x pi pj on, on the interval. So this matrix is known as Jacobi matrix and it's three diagonal. And the diagonal entries in this matrix that just come from the coefficient in the three term recurrence. So this is all very uh, basic and well known in, in the theory of orthogonal polynomials. And so very interesting and important property for us is that the eigenvalues of this uh, uh, matrix M of X are exactly the roots of the orthogonal polynomial of the next degree R plus one. So if you remember, we have just argued before that the bound for the, so for the special case when F of X is X, the bound is given by the smallest eigenvalue of this matrix, MR of X. I've just recalled that this smallest eigenvalue is equal to the smallest root of the next orthogonal polynomial. So if we know the behavior of the roots of the orthogonal polynomials, we are at home. And this is exactly where we, we now 
use the fact that for selected uh, uh, measures on the, on the interval, like Jacobi measures, which means uh, uh, the measure with this weight function with respect to, 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 to the Lebesgue measure, where lambda is at least minus one, then we know the behavior of the roots of the orthogonal polynomials. And in particular, the smallest root is known to be minus one plus order one over r squared. And minus one is exactly the smallest value that x can take on the interval minus one, one. So the bound is equal to the min f min plus this is the right uh, behavior of the error on the interval. So we can analyze thanks to the, the knowledge of uh, the roots of orthogonal polynomials on the for, for Jacobi measure, we can analyze the behavior of the bound when f of x is x. What about the quadratic case when f is quadratic, so x squared plus a linear term? So there are two cases, either the minimizer is on the boundary. That's the easy case because then it's, one can easily see that there is an, a, a linear as upper estimator for f, which is, so it's linear. As argued before, uh, then the, the error uh, range for f is upper bounded by the error range for g. And we just argued in the previous slide that this error range behaves like one over r squared. So then we have the full answer. And actually, this holds for any Jacobi measure. For, so now we have to look at the second case when the minimizer is, is, is in is the interior. So then the bound as is the smallest eigenvalue of this uh, uh, moment matrix, MR of F. So now F is X squared plus KX. So the moment matrix looks like this, this integral. And using the three term uh, uh, relation for the orthogonal polynomial, then we see that this matrix is going to be now five diagonal because we have a degree two here. So it's going to be five diagonal. And it's almost triplets. And this is where I'm using what the, it's on the slide, but I didn't say it. So now I'm using the fact that I'm restrict, restricting myself to the situations where I have equipped the interval with a Chebyshev measure, which means that the coefficients in the, in the three term recurrence are actually all the same, but just some constant, which enables to see that this uh, matrix here is uh, actually almost triplet. So you see here, you have uh, on the diagonal, you have all A's and all B's and all C. So it's almost triplet because at the first two rows and the first two columns, there are some uh, uh, non triplet things or stuff happening there. So this is creating the difficulty. But so the question now is what can we say about the smallest eigenvalue of such a five diagonal almost triplet matrix? And fortunately, we can analyze it because the idea is quite simple. So we have these first two rows and columns, which are a bit spoiled and which spoils uh, the nice uh, tuplet structure, if I may say, but the, the lower corner B is nicely five diagonal and tuplets. Then what we do is, so we are going to, to modify the first two rows and columns of the matrix in order to embed the B in a symmetric circulant matrix C. So you just do what you should do uh, on the first two rows and columns so that you create a circulant C, which contains B as a principal submatrix. And then you apply interlacing of eigenvalues. And you end up that the smallest eigenvalue of M of F, which is what we want to understand. So first, it's at most the smallest eigenvalue of B. And that one is at most the third smallest eigenvalue of C. But since C is circular and symmetric, we can analyze the eigenvalues. And then we fall back that, uh, uh, so the, 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 the smallest eigenvalue here is F min plus a term which behaves like one over R square again. So to, to conclude this, uh, this, uh, this uh, slides, so what could we prove? We could prove that if we equip the interval minus one, one with a Chebyshev measure uh, and for any polynomial, then we can analyze the, the, the error and we obtain the error uh, in one over R square. 
And actually, if you can do it for the interval, you can do it for products of interval. So you can also do it for the box as, as I've written here. Okay, so, so we understand the behavior uh, in the case of the, the hypercube equipped with, uh, with a Chebyshev measure. And then the next question is how to extend this for more measures and we are going to be able to, to extend this for uh, measures where lambda is at least minus a half. So lambda is equal to minus a half is a Chebyshev case, but we want to get more lambdas. And then we want to move on to other sets that's a hypercube. And that's now what I want to try to, to very briefly mention is how do you do this to extend the results which you have on simple sets to other sets and other measures. So to start with, let me tell how to do this for the sphere. So for the sphere, we can get the rate in one over R square. And this will be done by uh, using what I call here an integration trick. Somehow we're going to go back to the case of the, of the interval. Okay, so we minimize F over the sphere and we are trying to understand how does the, the upper bound behave for this problem. So as I mentioned earlier, we can replace F by its uh, uh, quadratic upper estimator, which you get by Taylor. And here, because we are on the sphere, X and A have unit one. So actually you can replace, it's not even quadratic this term, it's linear. So we have a linear upper estimator and it's enough to analyze the, the linear upper estimator. Now let's do a, a change of variables and uh, our, linear upper estimator, we can bring it to a very simple linear up, uh, upper estimator, which is just a single coordinate uh, uh, variable x1. So it's enough to analyze uh, the, the, the upper bound when minimizing x1 over the unit sphere. And now if you want to minimize x1, let me just show it maybe fully. If you want to minimize x1 over the unit sphere, then actually what's written here, you can see it as using the push forward measure. So minimizing x1 over the unit sphere will boil down to minimizing x1 over the image uh, of the unit sphere to so the projection of the unit sphere on the interval. So which boils down to, to making a, a, an integration trick at the end of the day. So we are going to take the optimal univariate sum of square for the univariate case, but now it will be with respect to the push forward measure of, uh, of uh, the image of the sphere, I mean the projection of the sphere on the interval, and then this, this gives this uh, uh, measure which I have given here. And since this is a Jacobi type measure, uh, we, we, we have, I've just explained you that in the univariate case, we know how to understand the behavior of the bound for the interval equipped with the Jacobi type measure, since here it's linear. So then we, we know this behavior of one over R square. So let me just uh, 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 repeat. So in the case of the unit sphere, we, de we derive in a rather direct manner so we, we can apply what we learned about the analysis for the case of the interval to get information on the analysis of the bounds for the unit sphere. How would you go about if you want to extend this to the box, to the ball, to the simplex, or to some special what we call round convex bodies? So this will be the same idea. We need to have a trick to transport what we know for for, uh, for, for some set equipped with some measure to, we want to use, if suppose we know something for uh, optimization of uh, a given set, what I call here or K hat, equipped with a given measure, which I, which I mean here uh, that we take a, a weight function W hat with respect to the Lebesgue measure. So this is a set equipped with a measure. And suppose we know the behavior of the bound here for such a pair. And we would like to transport this result to a new pair KW, which we don't know yet. And, and here I just give you a, a, 
a number of uh, conditions which if they hold, then indeed I can lift result from the known blue pair to the unknown red pair. So the situation will be that we want, uh, uh, so the red set is a set which you are trying to learn. So we want to, to that it is contained in the blue set where we know the behavior and there are some conditions. What we want is that the two sets look similar around the minimizer. So which means that, so K is containing K hat. So suppose the minimizer is here, then there is a small ball with intersection with the, the two sets is the same. This is what I mean with the two sets look the same around the point. So here we see that the ball, the intersection with K and with K hat is the same. And again, here's the same behavior. And, and then we want some conditions which say that we can compare the two weight functions. So W should be at least a constant W hat on a small ball around the minimizer and W should be at most W hat on the interior of the set. And if we have these technical conditions, we don't need to see them exactly. If you have a list of technical conditions, if they hold, then the conclusion is that the, uh, the error analysis for the unknown red set will be upper bound by upper bounded by the error analysis for, by the known blue pair. So here we know this behavior. So as a consequence, we can transport what we know for the blue pair, we can transport it to the unknown red pair. And an observation is that these conditions uh, uh, trivially hold if it would happen that the minimizer is lying in the interior of the set. Okay. So here very, uh, just to give you a very, only a brief feel on how the, the, the this lifting of knowledge would, would work. So we have learned to analyze the interval equipped with the Chebyshev measure. We have seen that we have this rate one over R square. Then the first step would be to transport it with the interval equipped with a, a, a weight function where lambda is at least minus a half. And this is using this, this lemma I just showed before. From that, we can transport it uh, to any set K actually equipped with uh, the Lebesgue measure if the minimizer lies in the interior. After that, we can already deal with a simplex equipped with the Lebesgue measure, because if you have such a simplex, you can uh, uh, rotate it so that you place it like this in inside a cube. And then you see that say if the minimizer would be here, then you have the local similarity. If the minimizer would be here, it would be the same. So you can apply, apply all these tricks. Uh, we can move to the ball again, equipped with such a, a weight function, again, by doing an integration trick. And from the ball, we can move to round convex bodies, which are convex bodies where at every point on the boundary, you want to have an inscribed ball and the circumscribed ball containing the round body, which are tangent at the boundary at a given point. So it's a special class of uh, uh, convex bodies for which actually we can get this one over R square uh, improved convergence rate compared to the log R over R to the square we had in the beginning in general. Okay, so this is, uh, um, I, I, it has maybe been a bit quick, but at least I hope that uh, I've succeeded to convey the idea that uh, in order to analyze the upper bounds, the key fact was first to, to rely on the eigenvalue reformulation of the upper bounds, and then to exploit the fact that in the special univariate case, we could relate to uh, uh, extremal roots of orthogonal polynomials where we could exploit the knowledge which is available on uh, the behavior of extremal roots of orthogonal polynomials. So now what I want uh, to do in the last five to 10 minutes, if I may, uh, is to go back to the, to the lower bound, which were just the more usual sum of squares uh, uh, 
hierarchy, which, which most of you know, and in the case of the unit sphere. So, and because I, I want, as I want to try to convey, actually for the lower bounds, uh, the analysis is way more complicated and needs uh, uh, new ideas. But nevertheless, there is a, an interesting interplay. We are going to be able to use the knowledge of the upper bounds at certain step in order to derive knowledge on the behavior of uh, the error for the lower bounds. So I, I'm now going to describe the result of Fang and Fuzzy. I'm going to describe uh, uh, how, how they arrived to this uh, analysis. So, okay, so let, let me just recall what were the, the, the lower bounds. So these are just the usual uh, sum of square lower bounds as uh, that, that you have discussed several times already. So we fix a, a, a degree bound R and then we want to find the largest lambda for which F minus lambda is a sum of square on the unit sphere. That's uh, the usual Lasser lower bound. And we want, the, the goal is to show that the error behaves in one as one over R square. So now the strategy will be, so here, what strategy is to find a nice sum of square again. So you want to find a, a small lambda, you want to find a, a, a nice sum of squares, sigma, so that F minus lambda is this sum of square, and you want this lambda to be small. So that's what, uh, and the strategy is uh, to use, to construct this sigma, we are going to use the so-called polynomial kernel method. So we want to find, uh, I, I'm now going to define a, a bunch of conditions on what kind of polynomial kernel we need in order to reach this goal. So we want a polynomial kernel. So a kernel is just a function k of x, y, which is defined on the product of the sphere with itself. If we have such a function kernel k of x, y, this defines in a natural way a kernel operator. Uh, a kernel operator, if you have a polynomial p, uh, it brings you a new polynomial kp, which is defined as uh, integral of py k of x, y with respect to, so mu here is a half measure. We this here, so this is, this is a half measure. So what conditions do we want for uh, the polynomial kernel k? First of all, we would like that it maps the constant polynomial one to one, which means that if you integrate k of x, y, you get one for f dx. So this is the first condition we would like to have. The second condition you would like to have is that it preserves polynomials of degree d. So d is the degree of the polynomial f that I'm trying to analyze. So this is what d is, so d is fixed. So you want k to preserve uh, polynomials of degree d. That's the second condition. The second condition is that you would like k to be close to the identity operator. So you would like that if you, uh, that, 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 that k minus identity is very small, where the norm of k minus identity is defined like this. You, you apply uh, this operator to a point of P and it takes a uniform norm and you would like to, this to be small, at most to some epsilon to be, to be defined later. If k is close to the identity, it means that also it's in, it means that k is going to be uh, uh, invertible and its inverse is also going to be close to identity. And uh, if epsilon is small enough, actually the norm of k inverse with identity is at mostly epsilon. It's going to be small. And finally, this is a key point here, is that we want to create sums of squares. So we are going to choose our polynomial kernel in such a way that k of x, y is a sum of squares of the degree 2r on the sphere for any fixed y. Actually, so we, the way it's going to be constructed, it's going to be a sum of squares in x and y, but it would suffice if it's a sum of squares uh, in x for fixed y. So, oh, no, that's important. This. If we have this sum of square conditions here, then it implies that if we apply the polynomial kernel on a non-negative polynomial, we are going to get the sum of squares. If we look here, if k is a sum of square, if this is non-negative, then you get a, a convex combination of sums of squares, so you get a sum of squares. Okay, 
So I've just repeated here the four desired properties that we want uh, to find for our kernel. And on those these four desired properties, and we get what we want. So let me just, uh, uh, this is very easy to see. So let me sketch wh why is it true that uh, we are able to show the, that, the, that the lower bound is actually close to F at most three epsilon. So without loss of generality, the minimum of F is zero, the so maximum is one, so the norm of F is one. So by A3, we know that uh, the norm of K inverse to identity is at most three epsilon. So if we apply it to F, the, so no, it's, you get at most three epsilon, which means that K minus one F minus F is at least three minus three epsilon on the sphere. And now we have, we are going to apply the kernel K to this polynomial. So, okay, first it means that K minus one F plus three epsilon is at least F, is at least F but f is at least zero. So k minus one f plus three epsilon is not negative on the sphere. Now we apply k to it. So k, k minus one is f, so we get f. k times a constant is one because, because of a one, k one is one. So we get f plus three epsilon is equal to k evaluated as a, at a non-negative polynomial. So by property a4, it is a sum of square of the k to r. So we see that f plus three epsilon is a sum of square of the k to r, which gives a feasible solution, which shows this inequality here. So the goal is now is to find a kernel, a nice kernel k x y, where epsilon we are going to choose it of the form one over r square. And this nice kernel is going to be built using Fourier analysis. And that's the first crucial thing. And the second thing using the results about the upper bounds. So we are going to, so the, the key is to reduce the search for such a nice kernel to a, a kernel which is invariant on the action of the orthogonal group on the unit sphere. So if we, if we look at polynomials which are uh, invariant under uh, the action of the orthogonal groups, then we find the harmonic uh, polynomial. So in other words, the space of polynomial is, is can be decomposed as a direct sum of harmonic polynomials. And we are going to select the, the, the kernel um, in, with respect to this base of basis of harmonic polynomials. So here these lambda k are uh, the unknown things which we want to find. And here this, we are going to select a nice basis in the harmonic polynomials. I, I, I realize it's, it's a bit many details, so we cannot look at all of this in detail, but I just want to give the, the, the overview. So we are going to select, the so kernel is going to actually to depend, since it is invariant on the actions of the orthogonal group, it actually depends only on the uh, inner product of X and Y, not, not on the separate variable x and y. So we are, we, we are going to try to select it in this form where this c and k are the Gegenbauer polynomials, but I, I'll define them in a second. So here, the only unknown are these lambda k's, scalar lambda k. If I want to, to, to get the properties a1 and a2 satisfied, then I should choose lambda 0 is 1 and lambda 1 up to lambda d non 0. From such a K, I get a polynomial a kernel operator, which is going to map a polynomial P. If P, you, you write it in the, in the harmonic decompositions and P is the sum of PK, then KP is going to be the sum of lambda K, PK. So the lambda K are the eigenvalues of the kernel operator with respect to the, deco to the harmonic decomposition. So the next thing we wanted, we wanted to have K, which is close to the identity. So let's look at uh, what is the uh, infinity norm of kp minus p. Well, you just replace kp by its value and you end up with this decomposition here. So the uh, infinity norm is going to be at most, uh, here you have the infinity norm of the harmonic components pk and here you have the difference one minus lambda k. And uh, this uh, uh, infinity norm of pk, you can just uh, upper bound 
by a, it's possible to upper bound it by a constant CD times a infinity of P. So now we have singled out the sum of one minus lambda K. So in other words, uh, the, the, the norm of K minus identity is at most a constant times sum of one minus lambda K. So in other words, now it suffices to select these lambdas. Lambda zero should be equal to one. Lambda k should be uh, non-zero. And this sum should be small. And the other property which we needed, if you remember, we needed that k of x, y should be a sum of squares. Well, the best way to, to, to have it a sum of squares, let's just define it as a square. So we pick a univariate q of degree r. And then we define K as Q evaluated at the inner product X, Y, and then you take the square. In this way, the condition A4 is going to be automatically satisfied. And now we have boiled down the whole search to finding a univariate polynomial QT whose square, you, you express it in the base of Gegenbauer polynomial where the Gegenbauer polynomial as the orthogonal polynomial with respect to this uh, weight function. And uh, uh, so now the whole search is really just find this lambda k so that this lambda k satisfy this first condition that the sum of the one minus lambda k should be small. And, and now we are at home. So bear with me, we are, we are almost there. So we want a univariate polynomial q such that Q square, you express it in the Gegenbauer basis, and you want to find this lambda k, lambda zero should be equal to one, and the sum of one minus lambda k should be small. And now is the final step. Lambda k, now we use the fact that the, this poly, the Gegenbauer are orthogonal with respect to the measure. So lambda k is nothing but the integral of Q square versus the polynomial. Lambda zero is just the integral of Q square. So we see that the sum of one minus lambda K is going to be the, equal to the integral of Q square times D minus the sum of the polynomials of the Gegenbauer. So we wanted this to be small. The sum of one minus lambda K should be small. In other words, we want this integral here to be small. So we are searching to find lambda k. So we, we are searching for a q. Searching for lambda k is the same thing as searching for a q. So we search for a q, which minimizes this whole integral here. And I've repeated here. After renaming this polynomial here inside, which is an univariate polynomial, renaming it f. So we search for a q so that this integral is small as possible. And lambda is zero equal to one is exactly asking that the sum, that the integral of Q square is equal to one. So what do we see here? We recognize, we recognize uh, exactly the, the, the upper bound for the problem of minimizing F of T on the interval minus one, one when selecting this special measure mu. So fr from the analysis which we made a while ago, we know that there exists a sum of squares, which Q, so there is such a Q square, uh, which, uh, uh, which guarantees that this bound is behaves like over, like behaves like one over R square. So because of the analysis in the univariate case, we know that such a Q exists. If we have Q, we have the lambdas. If we have the lambdas, we have the kernel. And using the kernel, we can build the, the sum of squares, which certifies that the lower bound is one over R square away uh, from the minimum of F. So I, I realize it was uh, a, a bit quick, probably, but I hope that at least uh, the main idea, the global idea, uh, was, uh, was uh, clear enough that uh, in, in order to construct a good certificate for the lower bound, we are using a certificate for the upper bounds. But of course, there is much more in it, which is uh, that you have to use Fourier analysis in order to do the transfer between the two sides of the story. 
So this, uh, uh, I, I hope I've been able to convey that there is, a, I think, a very interesting interplay between uh, the both the lower and the upper bounds. Actually, we have been able recently to apply an analogous technique to analyze the lower bounds for, uh, for the problem of optimization over, over the Boolean cube. So then instead of the Gegenbauer, you have the culture polynomials and uh, so, so one, one can do something over there. Uh, and then of course, so, so crucial thing is what can we do for more? I mean, what we would like, of course, to, to improve the analysis of the lower bounds for more sense than the unit sphere or the Boolean cube. So, so now we can do the, I mean, thanks to Fang Fazi, we can do the unit sphere. Or we can also now say something for polymer optimization of, over the Boolean cube, but what about polymer optimization of the ball, over the hypercube in general? and. Uh, so this is still wide open because uh, the key difficulty is how to, to create a sum of square decomposition in the quadratic module when you are do, dealing with a general polynomial optimization problem. So, so there are some uh, non-trivial uh, difficulties which needs to be, uh, to be resolved there. Good, so thanks a lot for, uh, for your attention and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Thanks, Monique. Um, are there any questions? So I, <clears throat> I have a question, but I'm not sure. Uh, maybe it's a little bit uh, tangential. Um, so for example, uh, these lower bounds, I mean, uh, I can see the theoretical analysis, but one of the things that I think that I found interesting that's been coming up a lot in problems that I work on is that the lower bounds being theoretical are not, does not mean that you can actually find them in practice. So for example, taking a semi-definite relaxation means that the optimal value for the semi-definite relaxation gives you a lower bound. However, you can never solve uh, the SDP relaxation accurately. There's always approximations to the, to the SDP relaxation. So you never really get the lower bound. But the only way you can get a lower, a guaranteed lower bound is if you can actually get a feasible dual solution. And getting a feasible dual solution, which is accurately feasible, is also an open question. So do, does this analysis, when you say you're getting a lower bound, is that, am I sort of going off on a tangent when I'm asking this question, or is it related? Uh, yeah. Thanks for your question, Henry. I, I, I think it's, so now on another level, I think uh, he, here the question is: it's trying to say what it's trying to understand. What can we say on a theoretical level on at a given re relaxation order r? What can we say on the on the rate of convergence? But uh, but of course, this is a very good question you are you are mentioning. Of course, uh, uh, computing the bound in practice, uh, you you are dealing with all kinds of, uh, of uh, complications. I completely agree. But I'm not sure that, uh, that this theoretical analysis of uh, how is the behavior in terms of, of, the, of the degree order, of the relaxation order, uh, I, I, I'm not sure that that can say some, something informed about the question you ask. But I might be wrong. So this is so the goal of this research is uh, trying to, to 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 say something quantitative because so far it it is uh, the bounds converge asymptotically, which is nice, you know, it's asymptotic. But often you you want to to know, yeah, okay, asymptotic, but how fast? No? 
uh, trying to gain more uh, insight about the behavior of the hierarchies. So any further questions? Um, Monique, um, so with, with the upper bound and the FR and, and upper and lower, are there techniques to compute the next one making use of the solution of the previous one? So are there good ways to update those numbers? That's a very good question. Um, I, I'm not sure actually, because you, you are starting with an SDP, um, which, which it, it builds on the previous one. Huh? Right, right. But, uh, but I'm not sure that you can do a warm start from a solution of the lower SDP to the next SDP. Right, I guess in for the upper bound you have the the matrix, and then you have a bigger matrix, and and uh, mm -hmm. so I, I was just wondering if people have thought about uh, yeah, so, yeah. So you saw so in in the upper bound you would have knowledge on the smallest eigenvalue of a small submetrix of the bigger matrix. Right, right. So, so does it help? I don't know, right? I was wondering. So, so you don't know of any papers on on this question? Uh, so, so you would mean computationally? Huh? That's what you're asking. Whether yeah, like the warm start, for instance, yeah, things yeah. like that. There, there is a so that's a really there is of course warm starts for LP, but uh, SDP has been really difficult. But there is a a paper from Yinyu about uh, Yinyu Yi. I guess it's it's about five years now. Okay. But there are, yeah, very few. Yeah, it's interesting how much harder warm starts are for interior point methods. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Actually, I think that there is a paper by uh, Miguel Angelos and some other people. Uh, so they generate uh, cutting planes from the higher order relaxation that they add to the lower order relaxation. So it's kind of like what you were asking. Uh -huh. so, so they create a, like a level three relaxation and generate some cutting planes that they add to the level two relaxation or something like that. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, well, thank you for a very nice talk, Moni. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, Monique, I, I have a question. Um, on the second bullet that you have, uh, no, sorry, the yeah, the second bullet that you have with the paper with the slot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm wondering if it can be used towards proving some, you know, complexity lower bounds for functions over the Boolean cube. You know, there used to be for a while, uh, one of the most popular techniques uh, for proving complexity lower bounds of functions over the cube was to sort of say that the complexity class that you're interested in, the functions in that complexity class have good approximations from some uh, from space of functions and the function that you care about does not have a good approximation. And to show that that does not exist a good approximation, you use some version of duality to show some, you know, evaluate some linear functional in the dual space on this function that you're trying to show the lower bound of and show that that has at least a certain value, you know, um, in, in the dual norm. And the, the, this uh, sort of method kind of went out of fashion after there was a pro, uh, paper uh, called the natural proofs barrier for proving complexity lower bounds, which said that in certain, in many situations, this won't work, but then there were enough uh, contradicting evidence to the extent that 
you know, the natural proofs barrier isn't really a barrier in some cases, but then in any case, it killed that uh, the polynomial method it's used, it was based on. Um, so my question is now there are newer, and that, that was like, uh, I would say the natural proofs thing was in the 2000 or something like that. And so since then, very few people have been continuing to look at that method. I was just wondering whether this newer technologies, sums of squares and so forth. And also I'm looking at your paper, it looks very familiar with the use of the Krauchuk polynomials and so forth. Whether you've thought about sort of revisiting some of those lower bounds, which are questions which are still open um, on, you know, has anyone talked to you about it when you gave a talk or, is, there, is that in any way a motivation for what you did? I'm just curious. No, I, I, I would be interested if you could send me on offline the paper you, you have in mind. But what I can say is that, uh, what I should say is that, so we, we relate the, mean, the bound to the roots of the culture polynomial. But uh, one difficulty in this, that case is that you can only um, say something when, uh, now I will have to remember exactly when. Uh, so of course, a, a different when optimizing over, over the cube is that the, the, the bounds converge in finitely many steps in n steps. So so then what 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 one can say something about is when looking at the range r over n. So you, r over n. So you have to look at R over N, you cannot say something for R. Anyway, for R, for fixed R, constant R, but one cannot hope to say something uh, interesting. But uh, I mean, you're concerned about the convergence rates and things like that. I'm just taking yeah. a step back, mm -hmm. um, maybe to your talk from uh, Monday, um, whether, uh, you know, I'm just interested in, in, the, in the bounds themselves you know, mm -hmm. the, the approximation bounds themselves uh, rather than an algorithm to find the best approximation and how it qu quickly it converges, if you understand what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Maybe to prove the bounds, you have to use the algorithm, I don't know, but uh, in any case, we can talk about it afterwards, maybe. That would be great, yes. So uh, what I want to yes? I have a question. So in the proof you use, you have to choose a measure, right? So I was wondering if your bond actually depends on the measure, uh, if you, or any measure would work and lead into the same bond here. So the bonds will probably depend on the measure slightly, yes. But what right. the results seem to imply is that they are, the measure doesn't matter so much, I mean. At least the asymptotic behavior, the measure doesn't seem to, 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 to have an impact on it. Uh, but the bound should depend slightly on the measure, yes. Right. So as long as uh, you can find a measure for which you know the moment, then you're, in a, you're fine. I see. Yeah. yeah. If you want to compute, you better know the moment. Otherwise, you cannot even produce a matrix computationally. So that's right. A I think you should find you should select a measure with whose moments you know, and 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 then uh, uh, yeah, and then for the analysis you want to have a measure for which you can say something about. Uh, right. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, so like in the first approach when I said uh, you can just it suffices to to get back to the univariate case and by using the push forward measure. Mm -hmm. So on paper, that's true, but the problem is that we don't know the moments of the push forward measure in general. I so that's see. Quite, so we don't know in general the orthogonal polynomials for the push forward measure. So because otherwise I could have said the, the bound is equal to the smallest eigenvalue of the moment matrix for the push forward measure. It's true. And it's the smallest root of the orthogonal polynomial for the push forward measure. It's also true, but the problem is that we have no idea how these things behave in general. Mm 